We were at Big Springs, Texas. It's a low security prison. It's it's prison, but it could be worse. I could be dead. My name is Sidney Caleb Lanier. I sold fentanyl from 2013 until 2016. My parents were great parents who, you know, did everything they could to help me the best they could. It wasn't a matter of of me not having loved ones around me or growing up in a rough neighborhood or anything like that that led to the path that I'm at now. You know, it was not until after an accident that I had. Um, I got ran over by a pickup truck in 2001. I started taking opiates. I was being prescribed 40 milligrams of Oxycontin with the two milligram Xanax from day one. I started out on such a high dose that by the time I did start having injuries, or the, I didn't deal with the pain, so as the injuries got worse, there was nothing to, to deal with the pain anymore. You know, So that was from 2001 until 2016, it just constantly increased. You know, at first I felt sorry for him. I wanted to help him. I thought that I could save him, fix him, change him. And it took a lot of years to realize that I couldn't. Any day I was waiting for him to be, to die, to overdose. It gets to the point where the pain medications don't work anymore. You're so tired of this roller coaster, you'd rather just put a needle in your arm and make the pain go away so that you can raise your daughter, so you can support your family, you know, so you don't have to leave them behind, you know, and, and so you make hard choices. I've gotten to the point where I could use a normal amount of heroin that would kill most people and, and it wouldn't even do anything to me. And so I, the next logical solution was, was fentanyl and so I looked into how to, uh, to obtain it. That led to me finding it on the internet. The first thing that we saw, there was a shipment of fentanyl that was destined to Lubbock that was seized by um, Customs and Border Protection in San Francisco. We started talking to the Lubbock Police Department, their narcotics units, the Sheriff's Office narcotics units, and we discovered that they were also seeing an uptick in fentanyl. They were buying it in street level sales. The community that it was going towards, it wasn't the normal opioid community, it was, we had Texas Tech students at the college overdosing. We're learning new information about the long lasting effects of fentanyl. Medical professionals tell KMAX West Rappaport multiple people have died from overdoses in We knew that if we didn't get a handle on it really quick, it was going to be a bigger and bigger problem. He never left the couch and we didn't have people coming and going either. I never even saw a package get delivered here. So whatever he was doing, he was really quiet about it. Or he did it when we weren't home, I guess. Of course, there was more money in the house, but his dad had died the year before, and he told me that he inherited a bunch of money from his dad. And that's just what I believed. I didn't sell drugs a lot of the ways that most people did. I never had stood on a street corner. I never had people come to my house to buy drugs. My kids, I had people that were friends of mine that knew that I used drugs, that showed up at jail to visit me, and excuse my language when I say this, but they're like, what the f you sold drugs? You're a drug dealer? Because that's not the life I lived, you know? Did I, did I do some of those acts? Of course, but look back at Walter White in, in Breaking Bad. Did he stand on a corner and sell drugs? No. Did he go and push them on kids? No. Did he have drug addicts knocking on his door constantly to buy more drugs? No. How did he sell his drugs? I don't know. And I don't know how much I'd ever go into how I sold mine. I wasn't your normal average drug dealer. He started using the dark web to bring fentanyl in and he realized at some point in time there was an extreme um, market for it here and he could be very profitable doing it. It's amazing what you can do with, with synthetic drugs. He had a basic level of chemistry, basic knowledge of chemistry, and with searching different techniques on the internet he was able to basically develop a process where he could, he could use the drugs himself, distribute them, and, and, and make a big profit. He could import 200 grams, as an example, of fentanyl from China for around $3,500. And with 200 grams of fentanyl, through his process, he was making over $300,000 in profit. From there, he started recruiting other people in his organization to help him launder money, to sell fentanyl on the street, to gather money from other people that weren't paying. He became a, the leader of a drug trafficking organization in the classical sense. 
The first shipment that we detected was being sent to Jamie Robertson. And Jamie Robertson lived with Jessica Hole. Jessica Hole had been, she was known to Lubbock PD Narcotics as a heroin dealer for many years and they'd also made purchases from her and several of her associates. From that point on, we started focusing on Jessica Hole and Jamie Robertson as the distribution cell for the fentanyl. In the middle of the investigation, we had several people that walked into our door that were fentanyl users that had gone to drug rehab and as soon as they got out, they were contacted by Jessica Hole trying to bring them back into the circle of use so they could sell more fentanyl to them. We took the intelligence from those individuals and we started looking at an individual named Caleb Lanier. Caleb Lanier was purported as the, the importer of the fentanyl and he was the, I guess, organizational head at that point in time. What I understood of fentanyl at that time period, um, Caleb had been prescribed fentanyl years before they were a patch and they didn't work for him. Um, so to me, fentanyl was just another medication that he had tried that failed. I didn't know that fentanyl was a problem in our country. Um, I, don't, I don't even know that I realized opioids were a problem in our country. There was times I was so high, right, that I would fall asleep while I'm counting $100 bills, and I couldn't count them. And as, as embarrassed that I am to say it, I would have to get my children to help me count the money. As, as much drugs as I was on, I'm surprised he didn't get caught sooner. It took us till October 25th of 2016 to basically develop the case and arrest Caleb Lanier. There was a truck with lights just boom, turned on and I heard him hit the door at the same time saying DEA. And I don't know why, but I panicked and <laughs> I reached down and I had this lock box that I had the drugs in. I grabbed it and I run out the back door and I throw them. I just sit back down and put my hands in the air and I watch as they come in with hazmat suits and I hear, I can still to this day hear my wife screaming and my children screaming, terrified. And they were asking questions that none of us knew the answers to, um, you know, like what, what Caleb's been up to, things like that, and, um, you know, where did this come from or that, you know, um, where items in our house, where did they come from, things like that we didn't know. They took me into the garage and that's when they started saying like, Oh, we know about all of the the drugs and the drug dealing and we I had no idea what they were talking about and then about four o'clock that day they arrested me for conspiracy um, they arrested me my husband and the two girls that he had been I guess dealing drugs with that whole day was just mind-blowing because, I mean, it's something you see in a movie. It's not something you expect to happen. Especially, you know, I mean, I'm a good mom. I was a, a you know, a senior in college. I, you know, was just taking care of my kids and trying to graduate so that I could get away from him because I couldn't fix him. Learn the powerful drug fentanyl found inside the Southwest Lubbock home where a man was arrested yesterday. His wife now also behind bars. In I spent eight nights in jail. Um, wasn't allowed to see my kids. They weren't allowed to come visit me. I got one phone call with them while I was in jail. Found out that they were in the children's home. They spent four weeks in foster care. So when I go to get sentenced, it wasn't a batter of oh, I'm terrified, I'm scared, I'm, I'm worried. Whatever they gave me, it was fair, because truth is, I deserved it. Lanier, who pleaded guilty in February to conspiracy to distribute and possess with intent to distribute fentanyl, sentenced to a little more than 11 years in federal prison. We read more headlines, like the one from Lubbock, Texas, where defendant received 11 years in federal prison for conspiring to distribute fentanyl. We need to do everything within our collective power to stop people who distribute this poison. I still wake up and go, how did we get here? Because we were normal people. I mean, yeah, I had a husband who had back problems and an addiction problem. You know, I worked or went to school and, you know, took care of the household. Our house was clean. Our kids were clean and fed. And I still wake up some days and go, how did we get here? We spent a lot of time with established criminal organizations, gang members, um, cartel figures, that's pretty much the bulk of our work. And it has been for my whole time in DEA. What's unique about him is he was able to, 
he kind of bypassed the system. He went out on his own, he found a source of supply for drugs. He didn't have to really do much more than communicate via the internet or telephone or he just found a lab in China that was willing to guarantee their product and he was able to import it and he started his own criminal organization with with very few people and very little you know aptitude in the beginning to do this. You know now that he's clean I see I see so much of the person he was and I, I know that he can be good again. So I look forward to the future and him being healthy and clean and having grandkids and, you know, just growing old together, hopefully. <laughs>